Hello watch enthusiasts! Now Patek Philippe is really one of those brands which is spoken about very extensively, and certainly has an incredibly rich history in terms of what it's provided to the watch industry in its very particular way. And really I think alongside Rolex and Omega, it is one of the most recognised brands in the world. And amongst their catalogue and their inventory of watches, several pieces stand out as incredibly important pieces and most loved pieces, and these include for example the Calatrava as their dress watch, the Nautilus, as the watch which, uh, which redefined the way Patek looked. And this third piece which I'd like to speak about is the Perpetual Calendar Chronograph. And the history of this, uh, this particular innovation that Patek have, have devoted their time and, and their work to has been spoken about by a great many people. But today I'd like to give my spin on the, this, the history of these watches, going all the way from 1941 to the present day. And whilst it is true that other people have addressed this, uh, this topic and this theme, I've been asked to talk about these because it's true that I rarely speak about Patek, and really I ought to, ought to include them more because they did play such an important role in the history of watchmaking. And sitting in the upper echelons of, of Patek Philippe's range, the Perpetual Calendar Chronograph was something which was unattempted by other brands for a number of years after Patek started making them, and so really is something which is closely associated with this brand and this, uh, this form of high horology. And I will note that in this video I won't be speaking about uh, even more complicated pieces, such as for example the 5208, um, being a version which has a chronograph as well as a perpetual calendar, but with an extra set of features and a much higher list price, it's not the area which I'll be looking at in this video. Instead I'm going to look directly at those which include only the perpetual calendar, the chronograph, and uh, with these watches, as always, the moon phase. Now the story of the Patek Philippe perpetual calendar chronograph begins in the early 1940s, but I feel to be able to appreciate what the, the 1518, the reference 1518, the first of these watches, represents, one has to understand Patek of the period. And whilst this is spoken about in a number of articles, I feel it should be noted here that Patek Philippe wasn't a brand which, which traditionally produced complicated wristwatches. Now whilst they were very much a luxury brand of the period, they only ever produced a very complex wristwatches upon special request, and so to produce a serially um, produced version of, uh, of their watches, which included all of these features as standard, was very new to the brand. And so really the, the models which one recognises from the brand in the period was for example the 1932 release of the Calatrava, which continues to the present day as their most formal dress watch. And the 1518 was produced between 1941 and 1954, but bearing in mind the fact that Patek weren't the immense manufacturer they are today, only 281 of these were produced in that period, which seems relatively little, bearing in mind that Rolex make uh, over a thousand watches a day. So, uh, so one does have to consider the, the, the scale of production here, and of course bearing in mind that the value of these watches in good condition is, is very high. But in terms of the, uh, the, the numbers here, most were, uh, were in yellow gold, whilst only 60 were rose gold, and then only 4 were steel, um, being the most valuable amongst these, as a result of their rarity. But I feel the design of this watch and the, the, the choice of materials does say a lot about the way in which this watch was, was intended to be worn, because certainly these pieces were not the, uh, the, the be-all and end-all luxury pieces they are today, and I feel this is important to remember, bearing in mind the fact that some of these watches were ordered in steel um, as opposed to gold, and so, uh, so one can see that there was an element of functionality and daily practicality to these pieces. However, one should still remember that these were very valuable watches in the period, and while still remembering that watches at the time were not the luxury that they are today, these pieces would have cost, accounting for inflation, today about 14,000 Swiss francs, which is uh, of course a lot of money by today's standards, but by, by those standards really wasn't an, an impressive and rather imposing piece for its price. And of course this doesn't go, um, doesn't go without saying was down to the complexity of these watches, as these were the first uh, mass or serially produced complicated watches from Patek, and in a sense changed their identity into a brand that specialised in these sorts of products. And this was also the first perpetual calendar chronograph seen in a wristwatch, um, and, and thus is a very important piece historically. And inside this watch's 35mm case, one had a movement which is far removed from the Patek of today, because whilst very well decorated, and certainly one, one can't fault it for its decoration, this was a velju based movement that was called the Calibre 13130, and this used a, a Velju manually wound chronograph um, as its base, and from there used a, um, a, a sort of a series of modifications to create this perpetual calendar. And so on the dial one can see the different functions from the running seconds at 9 o'clock, the, the minutes of the chronograph at 3, the, uh, the pointer date at 6, with the, the moon phase within it, and then of course the day of the week, and the, the month at 12 o'clock. And then of course in the centre one had the chronograph hand, and then these leaf hands, which were very much something of their periods to decorate the dial in the front of the watch. 
and mechanically the piece also had a few additions, such as a Breguet overcoil and a swan neck regulator for more, uh, more fine-tuning of the timekeeping of this timepiece. But the dial is an interesting area, because one does have a design which is in many ways far more, um, more, more functional and utilitarian than one would see from later models in the Perpetual Calendar Chronograph line, because one had a tachymeter around the edge of the dial on this, um, this enameled surface to the dial, in addition to the sunken sub-registers for the, the two horizontal sub-dials, the, these beautiful leaf hands, in addition to, uh, to gold-applied markers in the form of Arabic numerals on these pieces. But aside from the silvery dial and, uh, and wheels, this watch did have one interesting and very colourful detail on the moon phase, which had this blue enamelled surface, in addition to these, uh, these golden-applied elements for the stars and for the moon, which give a very interesting element to this timepiece, and certainly make it a very beautiful uh, part of this, uh, this line. And the next watch in the story of the, the Petit Philippe Perpetual Calendar Chronograph is the incredibly revered 2499. And this is a piece which in my eyes is the most important in this video, because it marks the transition from, from Petit Philippe of the 1940s and 50s into the modern day, and I hope that'll become clear as I describe it. But this piece was actually released during the Steve's production of the 1518, because it was released between 1950 and 1951. There's some debate as to which year it was actually it actually started to be produced. But with regards to the production of this watch, it went on until 1985, and so had an extremely long production life. And so in that sense, um, is, a, is a piece which does describe Pettig of the period, because despite being produced for, for 35 years, only 349 were made. And where the similarities were concerned with the 1518, as a result of being produced at the same time, it did share the same movement, and so there was no innovation in that sense. But the case changed very profoundly, as the case itself became much more rounded and much more luxurious in my eyes. One also saw these ridged lugs which have been maintained in the Petek line to the present day, in some form or other, and certainly are, are, are a staple of this, this line. One also saw the large crown held, uh, held from the previous period, and on the, the first generation of these, because there are four generations of 2499, one saw the, uh, the watch maintain even, even more elements of its predecessor. And the first generation of this watch was produced from, uh, from the, the start of the, the product line until the mid-1950s. And of course, whilst it, uh, it had this new 37.7mm case with the new lugs, it retained a tachymeter on its dial, and in fact shared the dial with the, um, with the, the 1518, um, which was uh, which notably featured the, the same tachymeter around its edge, in addition to the same layout and the same design. One also still retained Arabic numerals, and also had the squared pushers, or those rectangular pushers, of the 1518 instead of the pump pushers, which came later. In many ways, the second generation was the largest change in the production of this model, because this piece was produced until 1960, and replaced the, the rectangular pushers on the, the first generation, with pump pushers which were larger and, and, um, and more significant in size. It also still retained the tachymeter on the dial, and you had the option on this piece of either, either baton-style indices applied to the dial in gold, or the option of Arabic numerals as with its predecessor, um, in the form of 1518 and the first generation 2499. And so this was a real, uh, a real jump between these two models. One also sees the beginning of seeing Dauphine hands on these instead of leaf hands, thus again showing a, a move towards modernity. The third generation then saw a, a complete overhaul, really, of the design, because the dial no longer featured the tachymeter, but still retained all of the changes made to the second generation. And so the dial was in many ways less cluttered, but nonetheless the, the, uh, the second track didn't move right to the very edge of the dial, and remained very much a, a railway style of fully connected form. And so these did still remain a relatively um, old-fashioned looking, at least by modern standards, um, but with their Dauphine hands they, they form a very interesting bridge, these also featured the, uh, the change of only having uh, baton indices available, and of course retained the pump pushers. And these pieces were produced until 1978, so they had an 18-year span, and so they did have a very long life of production. And the fourth generation which bookended this reference was made from 1978 to 1985, and this was very similar to the third generation, with the most, most major change and the most discussed change being the addition of a sapphire crystal and thus making this watch uh, one of the, the early adopters of sapphire crystals in the industry, bearing in mind that Rolex also adopted, um, adopted the sapphire crystal to some of their models during this period in the early 1980s. Now it should be noted that whilst the vast majority of these pieces were produced before 1985, and produced in the, the three tones of gold, so, uh, so that's rose gold, yellow gold, and white gold, they did continue production until about 1987, when two platinum versions were made, one which has been kept by Bedek Philippe, and the other one which was owned for a number of years by Eric Clapton. 
1986, the successor to the 2499 was released in the form of the 3970. And this piece had quite a long life as well, running all the way through to 2004. And it maintained the lines of its predecessor, however it gained a softer form in some ways, whilst also dropping to 36mm instead of 377 so somewhere between the 35 of the original and the, uh, the size of the 2499. And these pieces were made in much larger numbers than, than former models, so 4,200 were made during this period, with, uh, with, uh, with all three tones of gold as well as platinum being made. And these pieces came with one really very major change where the movement was concerned, because now they changed to a movement by the name of the CH27-70Q, which was based on a movement which is, is uh, incredibly well-loved in the industry, and is one which I've spoken about quite extensively on the channel. And this, of course, is the 1942 Lamania 2310. And this is a movement which, in the form of the 2510, with the 12-hour the subdial at uh, 6 o'clock, became the Omega 321, and so was an incredibly revered um, movement running at 18,000 vibrations per hour, and a piece which, uh, which really was a, a staple in the, the manually wound chronograph world, and certainly in the form of, of the 861, Omega's uh, modification of this movement, lives on today in the later 1861. And this is a movement which has seen an incredible range of different versions made, which uh, even formed the underpinnings of uh, some of Omega's first, uh, first automatic chronographs, like the 1040, which, uh, which featured some of, their, um, the, some of the elements of the, the 321, and thus some of the, the Lamania 2510. But this was the movement chosen for this watch, which was of course heavily modified by Petic to include that perpetual calendar. The change of movement also brought on a change to the subdials, because instead of having, um, having only one single measure shown on each of the, um, the horizontally orientated subdials, they now became coaxial. And so on the inside, with those blue tans, one now saw the, uh, the use of, of the, the leap year being shown on the right-hand subdial, whilst the left-hand one also had the, the 24 hours. And so one had an interesting reuse of this space for a new purpose. But the dial itself changed quite significantly to look more modern, because it, it had a new style of text on the dial, in addition to also having unlinked markers. And by this I mean there was no longer a railway track style link between the markers around the edge of the dial, or on the subdials, thus giving the watch a very modern look. There were also a few dials in different colours with this series, notably black dials became, uh, became more common, in addition to the, uh, the, the use of some diamond dials um, seen on, on some platinum versions, and even versions with breguet numerals have appeared from time to time. Now, with reference to the three series of these watches, this is a more loose term than with the, the 2499, but generally speaking, the first series was seen as the first hundred or so watches, which were seen in gold, and which featured a, a snap-on case back. And these also featured off-white subdials, which meant that one had a slight colour difference between the subdials and the rest of the dial, which, uh, which created a slightly different, uh, different appearance. But in terms of the way these pieces uh, these pieces looked from the front, they did look very similar to others, and certainly without putting one of these right next to a second or third series, it would be very difficult to tell another uh, yellow gold piece apart. But interestingly, they did also offer the 3971, which was effectively identical, but featured instead of a closed snap-on case back, which is pressed into place, it had a version with an exhibition case back so you could see the movement. Following this first series of, of a small number of watches, the rest of this run until 19, uh, 1991 is often seen as the second series. And these pieces, instead of having a, a snap-on case back, featured a screwed-on case back, and they removed the, uh, the sort of nomenclature difference of the 3970 to the 3971, where instead um, the, uh, the case back came closed. But there are several instances where someone has special ordered a, an exhibition case back for these pieces, and so these did exist during the period, and so one does see them appear on the market. Now, unlike the earlier version, it should be noted that this piece no longer featured a difference in colour between the subdials and the rest of the dial, and so was a uniform silver in terms of its appearance. And it was also around this time when some of these models were redesignated 3970E, meaning it or water resistant, because with this, uh, this new uh, screw-on case back, they could certify a certain resistance to moisture, to, to dust, and also to water. The third series, which was produced until 2004, was in many ways the most different, because this piece, despite having the longest life of all of these versions, was rather different in the sense that the, uh, the case-back solution had now been changed again. Because in this, uh, in this case, both case-backs, both the closed and the exhibition case-back, were included with the purchase, and so you were able to, to interchange them um, depending upon what you preferred, although I must say, bearing in mind how beautiful the movements are in these pieces, I really wouldn't, uh, wouldn't imagine that anyone would, uh, would choose to have a closed case-back over the open option. This third series also saw a few dial changes, because in addition to the new case back, 
The dials of these pieces were now a much crisper silver, with more uh, more heavily defined black markers and and uh, and indeed indications printed onto the dial. Then there was a change in the indices in the hands, because where previous versions had, had leaf hands which acted as a certain throwback to the 1518, um, where uh, where in fact during the 2499's production run they become Duffin hands. This now went uh, went to pencil hands, which were uh, were slightly sl- slimmer, and were uniform in their thickness and um, down their length. Also, the traditionally rectangular baton indices, which were applied to the dial in gold, now featured tips to make them pointed, and also to match those pencil hands. The next piece I'd like to speak about was an offshoot of the 3970, and this was the 5020, which didn't sell very well, and uh, was the, the large TV dial version of the 3970. And this was the 5020, which used the same movement, and in fact in terms of functionality was identical. However, it featured Breguet-style Arabic numerals and Breguet hands, and of course this very smooth cushion style of, of TV case, with these protruding lugs. It also had, had a crown which was sunken into the case, and this square form, and so really was a, um, a sort of a, an acquired taste. But, uh, but in 1994, during its production run, uh, over 220 were made, though, though less than 300, and so, so this piece has become quite a rare model, which is certainly very sought after due to its rarity in that period. Now, the next piece is a model which is, is quite a remarkable version, which is the 5004, produced from 1996 to 2012. And in, in many ways, this operated as the big brother to the 3970, because this piece featured a similar 30, 36 millimeter case. However, this added extra features to it um, by comparison to the 3970. And so, whilst of course retaining that same size, this piece came in gold and in platinum, whilst the last 50 pieces were made in steel as a, um, a sort of a run out of this model. And during this, uh, this, this period of production, only 12 pieces were made each year, which I think puts into, sp- into perspective just how, uh, how, how important this piece was in terms of how, it, how sought after they were. But of course, the addition of Rattrapant seconds to this piece gives a, a really new functionality to the model and really extends the interest and the, the, um, the appreciation for this, uh, this set of complications on a watch. And so this used a similar movement, and in fact the same base movement, however it added four jewels to it, giving it 28, and of course this Rattrapant chronograph uh, option. And so this meant that you had the normal chronograph pushers at the, um, at, well, roughly at 2 o'clock and roughly at 4 o'clock, with a Rattrapant pusher on the centre of the crown. And this meant that you could stop one second hand so that you could, you could take a measurement of time, but allow the chronograph to keep running. This would then be reset to the, the chronograph uh, running hand, and so you would be able to, to time two separate, uh, separate things at the same time, or take a, a midpoint measurement dur- whilst uh, measuring a length of time. And so this creates a, a really interesting functionality for this piece. But stylistically, this is also an interesting model, because its dial featured several elements which looked as though they were a, a break between the present and the past of Patek Philippe's range. And so whilst this model followed the case design of the 3970, its dial, with its Arabic numerals in addition to, uh, to those enclosed style of railway markings for the seconds around the edge of the dial, and also on the subdials themselves, and also, of course, those with those leaf hands, this piece really did resemble a, a 1518 from a dial perspective, which is a very interesting take to uh, to, to put an, an a spin onto this watch, because it does change the character of this watch from something which could have been extremely technical as a result of this additional functionality that that, uh, that Patek Philippe had given it, but instead it became something rather more charming, and I think is is to be recognised as one of the all-time greats. And to add to the the gold and platinum versions produced during this this watch's production run, and the last 50 being produced in steel, there was a unique piece made for, for only watch in 2013, with a, a unique style of dial with this crisscross pattern, in addition to uh, to to some uh, some applied elements around the, the windows in the dial, and this reverse panda style, which really does set this watch apart. But of course, it was produced in titanium, which is unique for the uh, this uh, this perpetual calendar chronograph line, and so makes this watch a a very interesting one-off. And before I come to the modern Patek Philippe and current Patek Philippe range, there is one more piece to speak about, the 5970. And this piece was produced from 2004 to 2011, and really was a successor to the 3970. Because this piece changed the design entirely, and in many ways um, was a, a really very successful change of design, which has led directly into what we currently have today. And this piece grew to 40mm in diameter, with a, a whole new style of lug design, with this jutting section which came out and separated the lugs from the rounded form of the case. 
the crown was slightly inset, and also it went back to these uh, these rather beautiful square pushers, which uh, which give a, a fantastic elegance to the watch, and especially in a larger case size, allow it to not appear too large. And in many ways, when speaking about this piece, it's much easier to, to, uh, to talk about the case materials, because really these pieces were only made in gold and platinum, and so it does make these pieces uh, much more straightforward in terms of being that high-end luxury chronograph with a perpetual calendar fitted to it. But the dial also saw a great deal of, of reconfiguration, because it retained the, uh, the sort of slightly uh, throwback design, which was brought in with the 5004, because it, it featured a sort of balance of new and old, which was extremely successful in this format, because it did regain the rail tr railway and, uh, and track style of layout for the, the chronograph um, edge to the dial, but also inset a tachymeter onto it, which, uh, which again was a throwback to the, the very early days of the 1518, which is a nice touch for this piece and gave it a more sporting element as well. It also regained the leaf hands, giving a very classical form, but unlike the, the 5004, didn't extend these changes to the subdials, which remained the, the far more modern style which was introduced in the late 20th century. And where dial colours were concerned, one most often sees, sees white or silver and black dials seen on these versions with contrasting hands, although there are a series of models which, which were produced in very, very small numbers with, for example, salmon dials, with some particularly rare versions being produced, like the one on the screen currently, with the, the addition of a Roman numeral at 12, and then uh, a variation in styles of indices around the dial in salmon colours, which are particularly interesting. But in terms of movements, these watches continue to use the same Le Mania calibre as the 3970, and so with these pieces one sees the last of the Le Mania powered uh, chronographs in this particular type of, uh, type of watch. Beginning in 2011, I believe that Patek Philippe moved into the modern era of their watches with in-house movements, and this came in the form of the 5270, which directly replaced the 5970, and appears at first to be a very subtle change to its design, because now it has grown slightly to 41mm, as opposed to the 40mm of its predecessor. However, it's also developed a few new traits, the crown is ever so slightly new, while also the dial has been modified to, to account for the new calibre. And so I'll start with the movement, because the movement in this piece is the CH29-535PSQ, and this is a, a chronograph with, uh, with an instantaneous minute counter, which means that when the chronograph hand hits 12 o'clock, the, the minutes jump over immediately without any delay, adding to the accuracy of measurements if you stop the chronograph around this time. Then one also ha retains the perpetual calendar and the moon phase, and now rather than having a 24-hour hand, it now has a day and night indicator on a window, in addition to the leap year being shown via a, an aperture instead of a hand. And whilst I'm sure owners of the 5970 will be very familiar with the 5270, as really it's, it's operation where, where the, the, the operation is concerned, winding the watch up, indeed using it with the, uh, the same use of a column wheel, it, it would seem very similar, but there are a few subtle changes, notably the placement of the subdials, which have now dropped somewhat, so they're no longer in line with the centre of the dial. And I think this is a very interesting and very elegant development, because oddly enough, I feel it helps the balance of the watch immensely and creates a, a very modern look to the watch in this uh, this perhaps slightly classic sort of, sort of concept. Then one should note that the dial has also taken some of these um, these forms that are echoed on the 5004, and so it's taken some of these elements of having the, the closed railway-style markers around the edge of the dial, and of course retains that tachymeter introduced with the 5970. However, it takes it a step further, by adding to it, by making the subdials also have that old-fashioned style of printing, which I think is very, very elegant and complements the, the leaf-style hands very well. And in terms of variance in the current range, this piece comes either in platinum with a, a rather beautiful salmon dial, which also comes with, uh, with black gold uh, applied indices, or rather uh, numerals in this case, in the form of Arabic numerals, in addition to also greyed um, leaf hands, which give a, a really wonderful look to this timepiece. Whilst there is also the option of the, the rose gold version, which comes on a bracelet, and, and also features a, a black dial with rose gold markers, and is perhaps the more ostentatious of the two, and so my personal choice would be the platinum. There is also a third version in the range, which is the 5271, and this is, this is a 5270 in platinum, with a black dial that's then set with diamonds on the lugs and the bezel. In 2012, Patek Philippe replaced the 5004 as the split-second or rattrapant chronograph with the perpetual calendar in the range with the 5204. And this model offered something rather different because it took all of the updates seen in the 5270 and added them to the concept of rattrapant chronograph in a slightly smaller package 
and a, a more classically correct size. So this piece still did grow to 40.2mm, and is significantly thicker than the 5270, despite sharing the same sort of movement, because uh, it's 14.3mm to the 5270's 124 but this is because they've had to add on the the rattrapant chronograph elements. And so this piece features a, uh, a, well, really all the features that one would expect on the 5004. However, where this piece has developed is that it's it's changed somewhat to have those those um, those subdials which have sunken down towards 6 o'clock, in addition to the use of apertures to show the day and night, in addition to the leap year. But this is an incredibly elegant piece in terms of its design, with a crown which is uh, delicate and small by comparison to previous iterations, but still with the rattrapant pusher in its centre. The hands are also new, which are this sort of squared-off dauphine shape, with bevels, and of course this piece has luminescent indices, as well as luminescent hands. And the dial treatment of this model really matches the way this case has this more delicate feel, narrower lugs, and these ridges, which are, are very much a product of the, the range um, that this watch has come from, such as, for example, the 3970, which uh, shares quite a lot with this design. However, its dial also follows this, because one sees a very classical style, with, um, with vintage-style numerals um, on the edges of the dial, and luminous Batten-style markers. Also, the subdials are, are delicately simple, with this rail track style, and of course they are sunken and, and beveled to give this interesting form, with these, these leaf hands in their centre. Interestingly, on this model, the moon phase has been moved to the bottom of the 6 o'clock subdial with the pointer date, instead of the top half, a first for this range. And where the dials are concerned, the, the rose gold versions of this watch come with either an opaline white dial, which comes out as a sort of a silver, or indeed the opaline black one, which gives a wonderful sheen and, uh, and gleam. There is also a platinum version on the strap available, which comes exclusively with that black dial, but instead of having these, um, these rose gold markers and hands, it now has those in white gold. And so with the 5204, I really have to draw this history of this rather remarkable line from Pedeg to a close. Now, of course, it is true they released some monopusher versions in the uh, the 2010s, but I feel these are somewhat beside the, the standard range, and so I won't talk about them in this particular video. Though if in future you'd like me to speak about any other Patek Philippe range, then do tell me in the comments down below. And if you did enjoy this video, then do please like, share, and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Armand the Watch Guy, out.